Good morning, everybody, and sorry for the small delay. Today, I will first answer some queries which were raised earlier, and in the process, we'll have a couple of quizzes. So, I hope you are ready with your clickers, and I hope to get a larger number of responses reaching us through the XML files which are FTP'd here. Uh, it was suggested yesterday that I should discuss uh, uh, image processing or fingerprint processing a bit more detail. So what I have done is an earlier C++ program which was used to convert uh, grayscale fingerprints into monotone uh, images. Uh, me and my colleagues have uh, sort of rewritten that in C last night. And since that program is fairly long and it incorporates features many of which are important and relevant, uh, such as uh, dynamic memory allocation, uh, handling pointers, uh, input output. So I thought I will discuss that particular program at length as a composite example of uh, several uh, features of C programming language. But first, some queries from participants. We'll briefly look at dynamic memory allocation and recursion, and then as I said, we'll look at the image processing problem in some greater details. After the tea break, we may continue part of this discussion if it is not complete. Otherwise, we'll discuss the workshop projects and the activities to be completed. The query is rather simple. I received an email. I do not know whether the figure that I mentioned here is exact or not, but effectively the question was, when people say 2.3 gigahertz clock speed or some such thing, what exactly does it mean? It's an important question and I'm glad uh, someone raised it. Although it is not concerned directly with programming, it is concerned with execution speed of our programs and therefore we shall have to look at what implication does a clock rate have. To understand this better, we will have to go through some details of computer organization, the internal actions that take place inside the digital computer so first we look at the processor technology. The traditional view of a computer organization, and this is by the way still taught even in CS programs at many places, where we say that we have a central processing unit comprising of a control unit and arithmetic and logic unit. Control unit has the responsibility of understanding our instructions and use electronic circuits to execute those instructions. Arithmetic and logic unit has the capability to carry out numerical manipulations or compare values and so on. These two together intrinsically work in order to execute our programs. If you look at an instruction, and as I had commented earlier, typically machine language instructions which are coded in binary form will permit various actions such as add, subtract, multiply, load from memory into registers, load from registers into memory and so on. These instructions themselves are stored in the memory as we all know because computer is a stored program machine. So these instructions, if they are to be executed, take any instruction which needs to be executed, it needs to be fetched from memory and then it needs to be understood by the control unit. For example, whether the instruction means add, instruction means subtract, since a control unit is not a human being, this understanding or what we call decoding is also done using electronic circuits. And once the instruction is decoded, it is then executed. If addition is to be performed, some data will have to be fetched from memory, brought onto the register, values to be added, and the result has to be pushed back onto memory. Each of these actions, though they happen at electronic speeds, they happen at discrete non-zero intervals and somebody needs to synchronize all these activities of fetching, decoding and execution of the instructions. Now this responsibility of synchronizing these actions, things have to run like a clockwork and in fact precisely for that reason a clock is provided within a computer. As we know the processor has registers which are like fast memory locations. Data is read from memory, processed and written back as per the instructions. So as I said, a clock synchronizes actions such as fetch, decode, execute, what have Now the speed of the clock, how many cycles per second the clock runs? Because for every cycle of the clock, 
some action will happen some bits will move from one point to another at the next cycle some other decoding circuitry will work etc et consequently the execution of instruction inside a digital computer is intrinsically linked to the clock and obviously the faster the clock the faster will be the execution of instructions now these clock speeds these are by the way crystal driven clocks these clock speeds typically range from 300 megahertz to several gigahertz 2.3 or 2.1 or 1.8 or 3.2 gigahertz these are typical clock frequencies available in modern computers that we see including high end pcs and uh, the general purpose servers that you see this speed by the way has improved from kilohertz upwards a kilohertz means 1000 cycles per second so consequently in one second the clock is capable of driving 1000 times a different circuits execution of a single instruction ordinarily does not happen within one cycle it may take several cycles in fact different instructions will require different clock cycles but what is definitely true is that since the actions need one or more clock cycles in general faster the clock faster will be the execution of instructions the overall speed will also depend upon the architecture of the processor while that is not the subject of study here but for the purposes of better understanding of happenings let me mention a specific architecture called risc architecture which stands for reduced instruction set computer typically instructions are very complex in modern machines but risc processors were introduced so that the instructions individually were extremely simple and therefore they could be executed very rapidly in fact typically the risc instructions require far fewer clock cycles to execute than their corresponding instructions in other machines in addition modern computers have an architecture called pipeline architecture let me explain to you what the meaning of pipeline is imagine uh, let, let me i think use this small paper to make my point suppose there is a lake here and there is a water tank and one person is capable of taking water out of this lake and putting one bucket full of water in let us say 2 minutes time imagine that there is a certain cart or a truck or something like that which can take this water and take it further to a depot let's say this is the depot or water reservoir and it takes 3 minutes and imagine now that to supply water from this reservoir to let us say our home one of our family members will go here with a bucket and will take this bucket from this reservoir to home and that may take let us say another 3 minutes if you consider 1 minute to be one clock cycle then typically a bucket is filled in 2 minutes that is two clock cycles the truck is loaded and truck brings the water to this particular point in 3 minutes that is three clock cycles and i go and fetch a bucket of water from here another 3 minutes three clock cycles so therefore the instruction to get one bucket of water from here to here will take 2 minutes plus 3 minutes plus 3 minutes a total of 8 minutes roughly eight cycles to execute this instruction however suppose i create a pipeline architecture that mean imagine that this fellow is constantly filling up buckets one after another the truck is perpetually moving to and fro and it travels back let's say in zero time and there is not just me but my wife my children my neighbors everybody is lined up here to keep carrying buckets now if you look at the water flow that will happen at the end of this pipeline so you can imagine that there is a pipe between here and here 
there is a pipe between here and here and there is a pipe between this point and this point as well. In short, we are talking about a pipeline. The characteristic of any such pipeline is that if everybody is continuously working, then while the first bucket that is poured inside may take 2 plus 3 plus 3 minutes to come out, but while the water is moving in this part, this person is adding more buckets. While the water is being taken out from this part, the truck is moving more water. Consequently, once the pipeline fills up, the water will continue to come out of this pipe every two minutes because two minutes is the time when this fellow takes to fill up one bucket of the water. In exactly the same fashion, in a pipeline architecture, when one instruction is fetched by the computer and it is sent to decoding in the decode circuit, the fetching circuit fetches the next instruction. When the first instruction goes for execution, the second instruction which has been decoded, uh, which has been fetched goes to the decoding and the fetching circuit goes to get another instruction. And this is very, very crudely and simplistically is the pipeline architecture. Suffice it to say, in the context of our discussion of the speed, is that a pipeline processor will be capable of executing one instruction per cycle. That means if the speed of the clock is 2 gigahertz, and it is a REST pipeline architecture, it is capable of executing 2 billion instructions per second. Of course, these are simplistic instructions. It does not mean that even modern computer can add uh, two floating point numbers of high precision of, of a billion times in a second. But effectively, the speeds have improved significantly. So in a nutshell then, the notion of a clock is, clock synchronizes fetching, decoding and execution of machine instructions. Faster the clock, faster will be the speed or performance of the computer. Roughly it will mean that our programs will run faster. And that these speeds have improved from kilohertz first to megahertz and now to gigahertz. It is in this context that I thought I will run a quiz on historical development of computers. So sharpen your clickers. This quiz number is 1-3 for all our remote center coordinators. Please remember to insert 1-3 in the quiz number. Let people look at this quiz. I will read it out. It says, when and where did the first stored program execute on a digital computer? You have four choices. The first choice says 1950, United States of America. The second choice says 1948, England. The third choice says 1949, Germany. And the fourth choice says none of the above. Of course, those of you who know the answer, the question is very simple. Those who don't know will have to guess. And you'll have to think about the development that was happening around that time and estimate roughly where the first stored program would have executed. Please remember, we are not talking about the first computers. There were mechanical computers and there were even electronic computers. But those computers were programmed or instructions were given using something like punch cards or paper tapes. The instructions could not be stored till the first stored program computer actually was made and a program was run on that computer. So you have to guess where the first program executed. First, let me freeze now this particular uh, quiz. Please collect the responses. Manjur, can you collect the responses here? Okay, so I presume that you would have collected responses. So let us see what do our colleagues feel about these historical events. Yeah. Uh, responses are still being collected. Some responses have come up. Nagpur, Nirma, NIT Suratkar, VJTI, Amrita Institute, Anna University Chennai, and Salem. Uh, can you refresh this list? Well, not much change, I guess. So people might have desisted from answering queries because they're not sure of this. Uh, however, I would have expected ticks uh, on more centers because this means that some centers are unable to send the XML file uploading the file. Quiz number again, please. The quiz number is 13 or 13. 
which number is 1, 3. Okay, we will wait. We will continue our discussion and we will collect these responses once again. But the, the next slide is again a, a quiz. So uh, while we wait for the responses to be collected, let me answer some other queries that were raised just now. One query was related to uh, uh, what you call uh, bi bisection method, root finding by bisection method. Uh, unfortunately, I do not have the slides easily available here. After the tree break, I will try to see if I can get the slides and if I can, I will uh, try to briefly go over that uh, process once again. Meanwhile, we have tried to uh, refresh the list for quiz number 13, 1, 3, the last refresh we do, okay. So let us see, uh, can you view the responses please? Ah, there are a large number of timeouts. I still do not understand the purpose of uh, meaning of this timeout, but nevertheless, yeah, please. So, A, B, C, and D, and there are large number of C's, some A's, and some B's, and no D. Let us look at the right answer. The correct answer actually is B. The first stored program machine called Manchester Mark I executed a program on 21st June 1948 in Manchester, England. Most people credit the invention of stored program computers to United States as a physical geography, but it is useful to note that the research in computing was happening in England, elsewhere in Europe as in Germany and of course in United States. And the British group actually won the race by executing the first stored program. This is the second quiz. In those days, on that, this is quiz number 14 by the way, quiz number 14. So I will request you to remember quiz number 14, coordinators please note. And let us have maximum number of responses. So please do not press your buttons in a hurry till the procedure is followed there. And after that, you press it. Even if you press it once, you can press it again. There is no problem there. We would like to see maximum number of responses coming up. Okay, the request was, please give the start signal clearly. Since it is not a timed quiz, please do not worry. But I am formally announcing start of the quiz. But we will wait as long as it takes. If once you start, it will wait for two minutes, I think. Within two minutes, you have to respond. So what they are saying is when the coordinator collects the responses, that will be the stop time, but we are starting the quiz. Let us go back to this uh, slide, please. So please understand this query uh, with this quiz correctly. Quiz number 14 or 14. It asks, the memory used to store bits in the first computer was made using, uh, those who are familiar with uh, engineering may find this question simple. The memory used a, transistors, B, integrated circuits, C, cathode ray tube, and D, triode and pentode valves. So you have to choose one of these four because there is no none of the above option here. So obviously the correct answer is within these four. So I presume that I will wait for exactly 30 more seconds after which uh, at each remote center, the remote center coordinator should just look around and if everybody has pushed the buttons, should collect the responses. So we will go over. I request the coordinators to collect the responses. Uh, can you collect the responses now? Okay, we got many more responses now from multiple centers. Surprisingly, we do not have response from Coimtur, Vellore and even Tanjavur. What has happened? I thought Tanjavur clickers were working. Perhaps some problem in sending FTP file, I do not know. Anyway, as I mentioned, if the coordinators have collected responses, we have a mechanism for you to send these responses by email separately and we could incorporate. But let us look at the uh, responses, please. I still do not understand the notion of timeout. Why should there be so many timeout? We will have to debug this. Anyway, we will do it next time. Can we have the bar chart? Ah, this bar chart says 
large number of answers are D, about 32 people feel that it is D, half of them about 16 feel that it is C, and 8 people feel it is A, and about 6 people feel that it is B. It is interesting that we do not have responses from about 171 people because of the time out. But you can perhaps discuss amongst yourselves to find out what your impressions are. But let me go ahead and tell you the fact. The fact is actually more interesting than uh, what we might imagine. The first computer used neither transistors because they did not exist nor integrated circuits because they most certainly did not exist then. Triode and pentode walls which has been the guess of largest number of people did exist. In fact, some memories were made using pentodes and triodes and some circuits were made. However, the memory used in the first computer comprised of a cathode ray tube. You will be surprised that cathode ray tube can be used to store bits. In fact, use of cathode ray tubes for storing bits was already happening there and that particular technique was developed further by Sir Williams at Manchester University and the tubes were known, they were patented by Sir Williams. This is a brief about the first program. As I said, it executed on 21st June 1948 and it found the prime factors of a large number. Sir Frederick Williams and Tom Kilburn had invented and perfected a memory to store bits efficiently. And they proceeded to build this stored program computer built around this memory. The memory had 32 words. Its arithmetic and logic unit could only subtract numbers. It could not add, it certainly could not multiply or divide. So how would it find the factors of a number? Well, factorization involves division. And what this computer did very simply is that instructions were given to repeatedly subtract a number which amounts to division. So that is how division was carried out. It could execute one instruction every 1.2 milliseconds. Considering that there are about 1000 milliseconds in a second and even if you assume it executed one instruction in one millisecond, it could execute a huge number of 1000 instructions in a second. These speeds appear laughable now, but those were the times when mechanical calculators and mechanical computers or computers using electron, electrical relays and so on uh, uh, were available in large numbers. And with respect to those, and with respect to human intervention required to give one instruction at a time to those calculators, this speed was considered very, very fast. So this is some interesting history. Let us continue this discussion and look at how the memory was constructed using cathode ray tube. It was patented by William and it was therefore called Williams tube. What they did is on the cathode ray, they, they could display, as you know, lines could be displayed on a CRT terminal. Today you see high-end graphics and whatever. We are talking about old days when cathode ray would usually be used, cathode ray tube would usually be used to display signals in waveforms from circuits. However, they used a dot to represent a zero and a dash or a larger line to represent one. Human beings can see these dots and dashes clearly, but how does a computer sense whether something is dot or something is dash? Well, this was done through special metal plates kept on the surface of the CRT, which could detect the charge and therefore determine that at the particular location of the metal plate, whether the contents were zero or they were one, namely whether there was a dot or there was a dash. Walls could also be deployed, by the way, to build memory. Later on, these were but they were too costly. Much later, magnetic cores were used. By pushing small wires through the magnetic cores, the direction of magnetization would decide whether a zero was represented or one was represented. In my own institute in the early years, when we had a Russian computer, which was roughly built around the IBM 360 kind of uh, system, uh, it had magnetic core memory. The advantage of magnetic cores was that once you magnetize a core, it remains magnetized. So consequently, once you store a number in magnetic memory, it does not get lost, unlike the electronic memory, which is volatile. Incidentally, I have included here a, a website, httpinventors.about.com, 
again if you just say Manchester Mark 1 or Mark 1 or first computer or first program, you will automatically uh, get a whole lot of answers which will include these details. Although not covered in the course syllabus, I would submit to my colleague teachers that it would be useful to once in a while share the developmental history of such exciting technology. Our students will definitely find it interesting and some of them who are actually interested in details and integrities would actually go around and determine in far greater details what was happening around the time when this exciting technology was evolving. That could definitely lead to a very useful thinking, uh, you know, uh, uh, contemplation on part of our students. This is a photograph of the memory which was used called the Williams tube. You can see that these long lines you see here are dashes and the dots that you see in between. So these lines represent a word and there were 32 bits in one word and there were 32 words like this and multiple tubes could be cascaded to provide for additional memory. Of course, the whole exercise was very costly as compared to what we see today. So much for the historical significance. In today's world, there are multiple chips, 256 kilobit chips, 1 MB chip, 2 MB chip, 4 MB chip, 8 MB chip. Notice that I write small b. Small b stands for bit and capital B stands for byte. You might wonder that when the memory is byte addressable, why am I speaking of bits? The actual fact is that the memory packaging in chips occurs in number of bits. Multiple chips are put together either in the same integrated circuit or next to each other and that is how bytes are formed. Traditionally computers were organized around words and you had a 4 byte word, a 8 byte word, sometimes even 2 byte words on smaller machines. Nowadays as I mentioned all machines are byte addressable and the address can be 8 bit, 16 bit, 32 bit or 64 bit defining the capability of the machine to address memory. Typical memory speeds today are 30 to 50 nanoseconds. What it means is that if a processor demands some value to be loaded from memory into its register, it can be done in 30 to 50 nanoseconds. The registers themselves which are like fast locations and an intermediate storage, very fast storage which is provided on every processor these days called the cache store can operate at about 10 nanoseconds. Sorry for the interruption, SVNIT Suraj says that we are able to collect responses from participants but are not able to send the file to your side. Uh, it does not matter, you can try to send it uh, by an attachment, uh, yeah, as an attachment to email and we will collect it and incorporate it here. So please do not worry too much on that. However, later during the tea break and during the lunch break, please uh, call up our support people and try to figure out why exactly while the file is getting created there, why is it not coming? Perhaps some proxy setting or something will have to be checked. Anyway, the memory, the digital uh, computer memory these days is volatile. There also exists other type of memory such as read-only memory which is a small component where something like a boot record of an operating system could be loaded so that even if rest of the memory loses its contents, when you switch on the computer, the basic program is available, basic input output program is available which can then read from desk and so on and execute it. You can also have programmable read only memories or erasable programmable read only memories. These are often used in embedded systems as I mentioned once. We turn our attention once again to programming in C programming language. We first discuss a very useful concept of type casting in C. As you know, all variables have specific types, integer, float, double, char, whatever you have. There are occasions, however, when we wish to force conversion of one data type into another to get correct results. Imagine this is a program code which is compiled and executed. What does this code say? Int m equal to 6, int implied n equal to 8 and float r. So there are two integer variables m and n having values 6 and 8 respectively and what computation we are doing is r is equal to m by n. All of you will recall the rules of executing uh, uh, sort of arithmetic operations or the expression evaluation. 
there is the expression on the right hand side both m and n are integers since m is 6 and n is 8 the resulting integer will be simply 0 consequently you get a wrong answer this would not have happened had one of them been a floating point number observe that left hand side r is declared as floating point number but what left hand size type is does not dictate how the expression on the right hand side will be evaluated right hand side expression is evaluated as per its own rules consequently if we wanted the correct result we obtained we must force at least one of these operands to be a floating point type because we know that if one floating point uh, operand operates with another fixed point or integer operand the uh, integer one is converted into floating point and then the calculations are carried out but if both are integer we can do nothing that is the reason why C permits us to write something like this in parenthesis just before M we write float what this float means is that I am forcing the type of M to be temporarily cast as float we know M is integer but for participation in this expression M value will be internally converted to floating point and the floating point value will participate in expression evaluation since the expression now is divided by n one of them is floating point one of them is fixed point n will automatically be converted by the compiler into floating point and a proper floating point operation will take place giving you a value let us say 0 0.75 if the values are as indicated now this operation is called type casting this is one example which illustrates how typecasting could be useful in ensuring correct numerical results. However, the greater use of typecasting is in terms of describing pointers. As you know, pointers are merely addresses which point to some locations, the first of a set of locations for you. So, a pointer could point to an array, pointer could point to a structure, it could point to a float, floating point value it could also point to an integer value since pointers are fixed length it is possible to recast the pointers so pointer may point to a particular data value but if we recast the pointer then the pointer behaves as if it is not let us say an integer pointer but it is a character pointer a floating point pointer and so on it is important to understand that this memory allocation we call it dynamic because it is not done at the time the compiler compiles your program ordinarily all memory allocation in your program is done by the compiler so when you get an executable file and execute that program well memory is already allocated every variable know where to set how it is addressed and so on now there are occasions when we may not know in advance the exact storage requirement of the algorithm so consider an array whose size must be declared with fixed value in our program. Suppose I am storing information about employees. So if I have 1000 employees, I will declare an array of 1000, 1200 or 1500 elements to accommodate me. But if we actually have less employees than that, some of the storage will go west. On the other hand, if we get even one extra employee, then the maximum size of the array that we have declared in our programs, well, the information about that employee cannot be manipulated at all. It is in such situations you might want to think about using what we call dynamic memory allocation. Here is a small example. First we note that the C programming language permits us to allocate memory to specified blocks of data. So these block could be as small as one byte, it could be 10 kilobytes, 100 kilobytes, 2 megabytes. Well, the programmer who needs memory can decide how much memory he needs and that much memory will be allocated by the operating system while your program is running. So this extra memory or a block of memory to be associated with your structures can be dynamically made available. Generally the call used to allocate memory to your array or structure or whatever is through a statement called malloc or m alloc or memory allocate. So it is, it is pronounced malloc but memory allocate means please allocate so much memory to me. Now when we ask the computer to allocate memory to us either we should tell it whether we are going to put an array of let us say 500 elements in that block or 
500 different variables of type integer, whatever we want to do, we have to somehow communicate it to the C compiler so that subsequent operations happen correctly. The mechanism to communicate that is again typecasting. So memory function, the m alloc function merely returns a pointer and that pointer is pointing to the memory block which is given by the operating system. And you can actually cast that pointer in any of the types that you want so that when you access the particular chunk of memory locations that have been given to you, you can make best use of them uh, in terms of whatever you require. Here is another example. I have a digital image. It has certain height, let us say H and width W. It could be measured in terms of pixels, inches, what have you. We traditionally meet, meet, measure it in terms of pixels. So let us say I have a 300 uh, 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 height uh, picture and a 200 wide picture. So 300 into 200 is the total size of the image. Tomorrow I may want to run the same program which looks at that, this image and say that look, I want to handle much larger uh, images or somebody else might want to handle simply small photographs and therefore the size is small. But whether small or big, such a variable size cannot be provided for in our program. All program variables are initialized either by us in writing program or we read values from them. So consequently, the if, if I have to allocate memory to large image, I do not know exactly what is the size of the image. In such a situation, what I could do is something shown here. Image is a pointer because MLOG gives you a pointer. It says image is equal to unsigned char star malloc size of char h into w. It looks complicated but simple to understand. h is the height, w is the width. So height into width is the total number of pixels in the image. If we imagine that each pixel represents 0 to 255 or that is the normal single byte value, then h into w also denotes the total number of bytes of storage that you will require to store this image. This particular value h into w, which would be an integer number ordinarily, is typecast using char because char is almost intrinsically same as integer, which is what an individual character or byte would be. You do not know how many bytes in size this would be. That would depend upon how float is stored, how uh, uh, numbers are stored and so on. But when you say MLOC size of this, computer is capable of determining the size. And based on whether it is 500 by 500, that is 25,000 elements or 10,000 elements or merely 20 elements, a memory location block will be given to you. And you can manipulate contents of that block, almost imagining as if uh, you are handling a predetermined size of uh, the array. So for example, once I read my picture element values into such a one dimensional array equivalent, I can access the array and pro, uh, process the data by saying let us say image pass greater than threshold. If so, then image pass is set to 255. As we shall see in the later example, this is roughly equivalent of saying that I am stretching my histogram and if I am converting a grayscale image into a binary image, 0, 1 image, then obviously I define a threshold. Picture values, uh, pixel values uh, or uh, what we call color tone values greater than that uh, particular average, okay, they will simply be set to 255, other pixels will be set to 0. This is a common operation that we do in converting uh, uh, grayscale images into monotone images. As I mentioned, we shall be looking at a program shortly. In a nutshell then, dynamic allocation of memory is often resorted to when we are not completely sure of the exact storage requirement and more particularly when such storage requirement is very large. Please remember that dynamic allocation of memory is rarely done for allocating one byte, two byte or variables or so on those better be declared properly and fully. Only for unknown entities you would like to do that and maximum number of times the dynamic allocation will be to sort of read large amount of data and put it in proper storage and that is what is permitted here by this dynamic allocation. 
before taking the break, I will also try to briefly discuss recursion, a function which can call itself. Again, all of you know recursion, but how do you tell our students about the nature of recursion and recursive call? Perhaps the best example is the Fibonacci series. We have already seen in this workshop an implementation to solve Fibonacci series, that is to get its nth uh, uh, term or something through an iterative program. We had written that small iterative program. Here is an example of using recursion. So this is the function that I have written, integer Fibonacci, integer n. It tests if n is 0, it returns 0. If n is 1, it returns 1. But if it, n is 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, whatever, it calls itself to determine that value. And how do it call it? If n is neither 0 or 1, it will put the actual uh, whatever parameter to this call and now the computer will take the value of n which is neither 0 nor 1 and call Fibonacci itself to generate a return value. So for example, if n is equal to 2, this return statement will be executed with n equal to 2 which means Fibonacci n minus 1 will be 1 and Fibonacci n minus 2 will be 0 and this function will be invoked again. What will it return? Well, now it has actually started executing sort of two streams parallelly. One which is executed with uh, value n minus 1 and the other which is executed with value n minus 2. If n is large, then you can immediately see that in the first cycle of recursion, the uh, Fibonacci n minus 1 and n minus 2 are being sent again for re-evaluation. But in the second cycle, Fibonacci n minus 1 will be evaluated as Fibonacci n minus 2 plus n minus 3. Fibonacci n minus 2 will be evaluated as Fibonacci 3 plus Fibonacci n plus 4 and this could go on. In terms of elegance, you have an extremely elegant solution because your main program can be simply written like this. So I define integer number, floating point f and I say print f, sorry, integer number and f and I print given number, I read that number and I simply assign to f the value of that number sent as a parameter to Fibonacci. So depending upon the value of num, appropriate Fibonacci value will be calculated which will be returned to this variable f. I would also like to caution all of you, recursion is very pretty and uh, in fact it is uh, considered an intellectual maturity to understand and use recursion. However, I would like to warn you that except for very small and almost trivial cases, recursion could trigger huge amount of execution time and more complexity. Seemingly, you are only adding numbers and addition of numbers, if you are adding n numbers, it should take order n time. But in recursion or in such kind of cases, the numbers when they become large, they cannot be represented individually on the machine using native capabilities. I had mentioned multi precision arithmetic because the paucity of time will not be discussing that but I will try and send a sample program by uploading it on the Moodle so that you can just look at uh, what exactly is involved when I have to add or multiply 200 digit numbers, something which we ordinarily do not do. There is a query, sorry, okay, the query from Anna University is whether it is for Fibonacci series, is it better to use iteration or recursion function? It is a good question and there is no unique answer sadly. Very, as a thumb rule, you can imagine the following. If the number of recursive levels required are not very many, then recursion does present an elegant solution. However, if value if the number of times that you have to do recurrence that means repeatedly call the same function is more then the complexity of that recursion increases exponentially. Consider this for a given number just to find the recursive uh, solution you get two numbers or two branches each of which has to find uh, uh, Fibonacci using the same rule so each one becomes two more. Consequently, you grow exponentially in terms of branches. So you are trying to find out, let us say recursively, the value of 1000 uh, uh, 
element of Fibonacci series, well, that may not exactly be a good idea. Uh, recursion is often used to implement some esoteric data structures in applications and certainly many things in system software. But to conclusively answer your question, normally it is a matter of style. When n is small, using uh, recursion has no problems. The use of recursion should be done when it is important that people who read your program understand what you are doing and therefore are able to appreciate recursion. In terms of plain efficiency, iteration of course in the long run is far more efficient than recursion. So you have elegance on one hand, you have efficiency on the other hand. And one is not at the cost of the other ordinarily. We would like to have both. So frankly, it remains your choice as to what you wish to do. We'll reassemble at 8.37, oh sorry, 10.37 here.